You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I'm David George Brooke, your, your host, That Gratitude Guy. My mission is to have guests that recall and relate moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching, and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or email david at thatgratitudeguy.com. And I'll also have that information and other things, social links in the show notes. So let me get on with the show. My favorite part is introducing my guest. I get to have a different guest every week, and this week is a great guest, no exception. Uh, let me tell you a little about Tanya Bartolini. She's a member of the Flor- Florida Bar since 2004 in April. A cum laude graduate from University of Miami Law School of Law with a Juris Doctor degree in, De- in December of 2003. A magna cum laude gra- graduate from Florida Atlantic University with a Bachelor of Science in International Business and Trade in May of 2001. She obtained her master's degree in International Business Law from the U- Université Telematica International in cooperation with London School of Business and Finance in March of 2016. As you can see, very accomplished. Her vast travels and living abroad have given her insight into numerous cultures, which has translated into better negotiating skills. That's great. And alternative dispute resolution. She has been a litigator since 2004 and conducted thousands of bench trials as well. She has practiced in the areas of law, business law, contracts, real estate, foreclosures, associate law, lemon law, commercial litigation, international contracts, landlord tenant, among others. She's a firm believer in communication, cooperation, and collaboration with her clients. She is the founder of Business and Beyond LLC, offering her business expertise through coaching and programs to help business owners thrive, create security, establish balance, and build freedom. Tanya, Tanya, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, David. I'm so excited to be here. Excellent. I'm excited to have you. So I always start out with the same question. Tell the listeners, there's viewers too, because this goes out on YouTube, but then also to the network on the radio as well. Tell the listeners and viewers how you and I met. Well, we met through a mutual connection that introduced us via email. And, you know, thankfully, um, he knew how to get us together because I love the fact that we're friends. I know it's one of the neatest things. I'm sure I've said it to you when I met you that just these random things. His name was Michael James. And I remember when I got the email from him and I met somebody you should probably talk to, Tanya Bartolini. And, and I just think, hmm, I wonder why he thinks I should talk to her. And we connected and hit it off and so forth. And it's just, to me, it's incredible because I have one sibling that worked for Boeing for 35 years, and I think he met three or four different people over the course of 30 years working there, and I get to meet five or 10 or 15 new people every day, and it's just so exciting and things. So so you, as we were reading your uh, bio and back to your many degrees in education, which is always something my parents really pushed on, kind of back up a little bit and talk about just after your degrees, kind of the direction you wanted to go, at least how it started out initially. I know you've, you've kind of pivoted once or twice and you're thinking about pivoting again, but kind of talk about the first direction you wanted to go as you wrapped up those degrees. So when I first finished off law school, I wanted to do international business law. Um, that didn't quite happen. I ended up being a litigator instead. I was in court the first day of my first job and I decided that I really liked litigation. Um, so I kind of nixed that whole thing or put it on hold for a while. And I just became a litigator. I did trials. I went to court all the time and it was very exciting and hard work. Um, and there's a lot of fighting, obviously, because that's what litigation is. 
And after doing that for a while, I decided that I wanted to maybe start doing transactional work and trying to tie back into what I had originally planned, which is the international business attorney. Um, so I went and lived in London and did the master's in international business law. And when I came back, um, you know, my husband and I had our daughter when we were living in London. And so we decided to come back because there's no better place to live than the U.S. Um, and that kind of thwarted my international business law again. Um, and I went back into mostly litigation, but I did start doing transactional work because I wanted to have things in contracts that would basically limit the risk of litigation for my client. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And go back to the litigation piece for a second, because my father was an attorney. In fact, I think he was maybe disappointed that I didn't become an attorney, too, because he had his brothers and my cousins were all attorneys. But what was it about litigation that you liked so much? Because I, I, I feel like it's like a, a, a three act play. I mean, it just it seems like there's so much acting involved in theatrics and so forth. But what is it about it that you liked so much? Well, it does have some theatrics in it. Um, the theatrics really come into play a lot more when you have jury trials. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of bench trials in front of the judge. So judges are a little less patient with things like that. Um, and I really like litigation because I can help people. I could find the loopholes. I could get them out of trouble or find ways to help them settle their differences um, as opposed to just having a judge decide what their fate's going to be. So the differences too. And isn't hasn't really arbitration come a lot, mediation, hasn't that come around a lot to take the place of some of this? where it's a lot less formal in the last 10 or 20 years? It has, and it has made such a huge difference. I'm a huge proponent of mediations, um, even if they're informal mediations, because they really do bring people together. They bring in an objective view of what's going on. Because anytime you're in litigation, I mean, you know, emotions are high, everybody thinks that they're right. And sometimes even if you're right, you're still better off settling and maybe swallowing your pride a little bit. Um, so it's really a whole holistic decision that you have to make, not just whether you can win or lose that particular case. Mm -hmm. And when I think about arbitration, mediation, trials, bench trials, jury trials, just the various forms of resolving disputes. Just taking mediation for a second, is there something from your experience that, of course, I talk a lot about gratitude and, and explaining to people, you should be grateful, which is focusing on what you have versus what you don't have. And one of my favorite ta uh, statements is gratitude turns what you have into a, enough. Is there, is there kind of a key to being an a successful arbiter or somebody who can really successfully navigate people through mediation and, and maybe understanding? Because we, we talked about here, she's a firm believer in communication, cooperation, and collaboration, kind of those three C's with her clients. Well, those are all really Really three important things. I think if you do communicate, cooperate, and collaborate, you're probably going to have success. So is there kind of a key for the mediation piece that makes those successful to get these things resolved? Yes, because trying to figure out what the real issue is, you know, because people say this is what I want, but it doesn't mean that that's exactly what they need, mm -hmm. right? So a good mediator is one who's going to probe into what are the underlying issues? Mm. What are the underlying goals that are there on top of legally, how good is your case? What are your chances of winning? Because once you find out what the real reason is, what the real motivator is, it's a lot easier to try to put things into perspective in a way that the parties can absorb and understand considering their heightened emotional state. Mm -hmm. um, and then they can make a more objective decision about how they want to move forward. 
And that's, and that's really interesting, trying to figure out what the real issue is, the underlying goals and so forth. And I think of marriages or relationships I've had in my life as one place I can think about it that I think is a great analogy is this idea when somebody's mad and they lash out at you, it's really something else. It was really from yesterday, the comment you made, which you didn't think much of at the time, but now they bring this up and they're still really mad, but, but getting to the underlying issue, but then isn't again, one of the keys to that, just really listening to these clients carefully and, and really, really being, I think we, we listen just, we just don't listen much at all, in my opinion, because you can tell all the time I've, I've said to people, do you want to do A or B? And they go, Yes. I go, there's a question there. It's A or B. It isn't a yes or no thing. But what's what's been the key for you? Has listening been a big part of that where you've really focused on that to help? You're 100% correct. It is all about the listening and asking questions based on what you've heard. Mm-hmm. You know, because you can really see where people are coming from and what their motivations are when you listen to the words and the things that they say. Mm-hmm. And you still have to probe into it. Yeah. You know, any attorney, anybody in a relationship knows, just like you said, sometimes people lash out when it's something that happened previously or something that really might not have anything to do with you. Right. Unfortunately, that's just human nature. Mm-hmm. So trying to listen and see what their motivation is, what their end goal is, is going to help you find different solutions and maybe think outside of the box mm-hmm. to make them whole again. Yeah. Yeah. And I was thinking, can you think of a time, obviously I'm that gratitude guy and I always focus on gratitude. How has gratitude played a part in Tanya's, you know, education and journey through life? And, and has it been something as a gratitude practice or is it something you've done in and out or, or partially, or how's it been for you as far as impacting you? I am a very huge believer in gratitude and gratitude practice. I do it every morning when I wake up, every Mm. night before I go to sleep. Um, There are so many things to be thankful for. And there are so many things that can go wrong, quote unquote, during the day um, that you really have to choose how you want to live your life. If you are grateful and you see the good things that are happening in your life and you make it a point every day to remind yourself of those things, your mood is better, obviously, because you're seeing everything that's happening that's good. It's easier for you to deal with the obstacles that happen throughout the day Mm -hmm. because you're a little bit more calm, you're more patient. And you can overcome obstacles much more easily, more efficiently with less effort. Yeah, absolutely. And do you think, uh, huge believer in a gratitude practice, if you are more grateful, your mood is better, you can overcome overcome obstacles. Do you believe that people can be changed from an ungrateful person to a grateful person? Oh, yes, most certainly. And how would you accomplish that? Practice. You know, I don't believe in anything such as perfect. I think there are perfect things for certain people, um, but I don't believe there's one thing that's perfect. Mm -hmm. And anytime you practice, you practice to better yourself in whatever it is you're doing. And gratitude is the same way. Sports is the same way. Being an attorney is the same way. I mean, anything in life, the more you practice, the better you get at it the more efficient you become, the easier it becomes. Right. And obviously that's been very true for you and me. And it was, I kind of noticed when you and I met very similar energy and attitude and so forth. And, and I guess what I was thinking as well is you have a friend or relative or acquaintance or somebody that says, you know, how can I be more grateful? How can I understand this? And it has to start with the willingness to do it. I mean, if a person does have, I have a willingness, you have a willingness to do it. And if we don't, I just think it's interesting how I look back in my life and I, I use my father in some of my talks. He's been uh, passed away. He's a very successful litigator, as a matter of fact. And I used to see him in court and it was like great theater, but uh, he took his own life a long time ago when I was in my twenties. And I, I just was always sad because he was very negative. And I'm one of the more positive people you're going to meet. And I think that people will say, well, I look back at my parents or you know, mentor or coach or professor or something, and that can impact them. But sometimes it's just, 
and I won't say the luck of the draw, but it's just kind of is what it is. And I just always thought it's just, as you just said, you could, your mind, your mood is better. You can overcome obstacles more easily. I just think it's a better mindset. And so it's interesting because you're going to, it's like I do this association evaluator where people you should disassociate with or limit or expand. And I think the expand is easy. That's why I thought when I met you, oh, I got to stay in touch with Tanya. I just love her. She's so cool. And then there's other people I met and I, thought, I, I can't be around this person. It's just, it's not good. It's too negative and so on and things. So uh, now, did you notice, I, I'm very, I have my two sons and I'm very proud that my biggest accomplishment in my life, regardless of what I've done is my two sons. How did you? your mindset change speaking of gratitude once your daughter was born and then i know now you have two kitties but how did that note did you notice a big significant change in your mood and attitude and and view of life oh yes <laughs> it actually made it much harder to be grateful um because i found that i was worrying about everything i was worrying about every little thing because i wanted everything to be perfect for her um, and I had to really bring myself back to reality because my, you know, job as her parent is not to protect her from everything. Mm -hmm, my right. job is to teach her how to deal with things. Yeah. And so I started, um, concentrating more on being grateful about the things that I can do to help her overcome her own obstacles. The fact that they're still young. So whatever, you know, the worst case scenario for something that they did is going to be a great learning experience for them at a very small price. Mm -hmm. You know, as they get older, the price they pay to learn those lessons is going to be higher. Um, so that really, it took me a while, but I did, and I'm still working on changing that. <laughs> did, Tanya, did that change a bit when you had your second child in terms of you've already had the experience of one baby and now the second one? Did you find you were able to adjust a little bit more and maybe, you know, like you said, it's harder to be grateful because you wanted a teacher to deal with these things, but was it a little easier the second time? It is because I had already started practicing with the first. Mm -hmm. So when I had the second, you know, practice made it easier. And I was already doing certain things that I just had to continue doing and continue um, building upon. So I didn't have to start from scratch with him as I did with her. Yeah. And, you know, and so just changing to another subject, I want to make sure I covered on our time on the podcast is that. Uh, as I was reading your bio, I was mentioning, obviously, very motivated in education. Education is such a huge thing. And one of the things I always want to get from my guests is for those that are listening or viewing again, is what would be some things Tanya would tell that young person that's 18 or 20 is going to college, some things to focus on, because I'm always fascinated where motivation comes from. I sometimes think you either have it or you don't. I, I don't know if there's a I've often said like work ethic. I don't think you can take a class work ethic 101 and then all of a sudden you get an A, now you have a good work ethic or personality or something. It's either there or it isn't. But what would you tell some maybe tips or things to that person? Tanya, tell me, what should I do? I want to walk a journey similar to yours. What, what little tips or reminders would, might you tell that person? Perseverance. You know, I'm sorry? Perseverance. Oh, perseverance. Okay, perfect. You know, life is tough. And being successful is tough and reaching your goals is tough and that's okay. And you're going to fail and that's okay too, as long as you get up and you continue to move forward to try to get your dream and your goals achieved. So always have a goal in hand, you know, don't just go aimlessly thinking, oh, I'm just going to learn everything I can. That's not going to help you. Yeah, you're going to know a lot of things, but are you going to be able to apply that? And so if you have a goal, which you can always change, but at least have a goal and work towards it, um, keep going, you will achieve it if you keep persevering and don't let the obstacles and life and whatever comes at you deter you from doing your, what you need to do to achieve your goal. And where do you think, speaking of perseverance, life is tough, you will fall down, get up again, have a plan, get a goal. Uh, where do you think your motivation came from? Because you're clearly very motivated. And I'm always curious where somebody thinks that came from in their life. 
I have to admit, it's mostly has come from my dad. Mm. He was a very life-loving, hardworking man. Um, he always wanted to do the best that he could with whatever he had. And so it kind of gave me that perspective from a young age and it just, you know, continued to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's so important because oftentimes I find people will say it's, it's one of their parents, which would be natural. And, uh, and then sometimes it's a, a teacher, a professor, a coach, or somebody that came along in somebody's life. I've also become more comfortable with uh, the answer being, I don't know. Because sometimes I look at my journey and I've always been motivated. I just, I did a talk a little bit ago. And one of the feedback was, is you're so energetic, but you talk so fast. Maybe you should slow down. Well, that's just not my style. <laughs> it's just, I'm not going to, hi, I want to talk about gratitude. So important. I mean, it's just, it's just not going to happen. And so it's so, but I don't know where that came from. I just have always had a lot of energy. It's never stopped. And, and it's really fun because when you exude energy and passion, people really pick up on what you're laying down, I suppose you could say, or what you're talking about. So it's so important and energy. And like I said, I remember when I met you, I thought, oh, I just love her energy. She's so cool. It's just neat. And you just sort of have it. But I'm, again, I'm more comfortable, I think, these days with saying some of this. I just don't know what the answer is. You know, and it's just, it's one of those things. That is a perfectly acceptable answer yeah. for anything, because yeah. if you really don't know, you don't know, and you don't have to know. Right. You know, as humans, there are so many things that we don't know. Right. You know, you know a lot of things that I don't know, and I know some things that you might not know. Yeah. And that's okay. That's what makes the world go round. That's, you know, differences are what can propel people to become better. Yeah. So important. And I think too, looking back on those tips, perseverance, life is tough. I just, I don't know where if, my mom used to say to me, life is neither fair nor easy. So get over it, you know, and that was very helpful to me because it's not a piece of cake and this, you will fall down. I'm just noting this because I want to mention those when we, when we wrap up, but you know, and get up again and get back on the horse and then have a plan, get a goal. I think is so important. And some people are just aimless and, and I, I've learned, especially as I've gotten older, not to judge. But I just think, gosh, what a waste of a human life sometimes that somebody doesn't really take advantage of these gifts they were given. Somebody told me this statement once I've used it in my talks is make your strengths productive, make your weaknesses irrelevant. And it's so important. Find out what your strengths are. I can speak to 10,000 soldiers, but I can't draw a circle to save my soul. You know, so I'm not going to go take an art lesson. I, I just don't think, why should I wear? It's not my talent. You know, my talent is over here. So, so speaking of, of going on your journey, talk a little bit about... Uh, business and beyond, because I know that's a new uh, venture for you. And you and I had talked about that previously, but tell the listeners a little bit what that is and how that's come about. So business and beyond has been created through my passion. Um, so I was an attorney for a very long time. I helped businesses with their legal issues, but I was never a business person. I did not do the day-to-day -day business operations. And my father, who was an entrepreneur, helped me open up my law firm. When he passed, I found that um, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I didn't know how to keep the firm and the business going. And so out of gratitude for what he had done for me and opening and helping me open it, I started finding different business coaches and different marketing coaches and different books and things and educated myself on running a business and how to make a business successful. And during COVID, I was a solo practitioner. I grew my law firm 40% by using some tactics that I had learned and put them together. And I found that I really loved doing that. I loved creating and propelling the business of my law firm forward. And it was so much work. It was going through so many different places that I want to take all of that and what I've learned and what I've implemented and teach it to other people in one place so that they can do it much more quickly than I did because they'll have everything more readily available to them. 
Um, and then we can create a better world and better businesses for people. That's and fantastic. Business yeah. and beyond. And you mentioned I'm a big fan of to-do lists and checklists and things like this. And I've, I've been a pilot for a long time and they always have a pre-flight checklist. And I just read a book called The Checklist Manifesto and it was talking about how important checklists are and how you can save make, make missing steps and so forth. So I realized that there'd be a long answer to this question, but perhaps you could give, having done all this research, maybe the top three or four or five sort of points, making a business successful. So what makes a business successful based on all that research that you had? If you could give us maybe three to five, six, seven, something like that, just kind of points in no particular order that you've seen that makes businesses successful. So one of the biggest things is having a business plan because that is your goal. What is your goal for your business? Where is your business going to go? How are you going to achieve those goals? That's your business plan. So once you have that down, it'll be a lot easier to figure out what you need to do because you're already writing down your plan of what you need to do. Tracking everything is a huge thing in being able to have a successful business because you don't have to necessarily micromanage, but you do have to know where things are coming from, what your conversion rates are, what's your ROI, um, what are the productivity levels of your employees? Do you have, you know, key performance indicators for them so that everybody knows how they're going to be measured and what's expected of them? Things of that nature and the tracking. I mean, especially with marketing, are you just throwing everything up against the wall um, and trying to see if anything works or are you actually measuring and seeing where are the prospects coming from? Where are your clients coming from? What's your conversion rate? You know, those are things that every successful business needs to know because once you know that, you can figure out, okay, how many prospects do I need to talk to every day in order to reach my financial goals? Mm -hmm. Because if, let's say, your conversion rate is 30% and you need three clients a month, mm -hmm. well, you need to talk to 10 people right. to get those three clients. So once you have those numbers, then you can really make a concrete plan of reaching your financial goals. And it's not as hard as most people think. Yeah, that's a good point. And you, when you talk about have a business plan, is there such a thing, and I don't know in business and beyond, uh, is what you would consider to be a template for a business plan? Or is, I mean, I would imagine people put business plans in a lot of different formats, but is there something that a template or something you would recommend that people kind of could follow that would want to start? Because that's like having the roadmap to before you take the trip and that kind of thing. And yes, there is. Um, there are seven parts to your business. So you need to have all of those seven parts basically written out on how and what you want from them. Um, you know, some of those are you. I mean, that's the most important part. And with you, you need to know what are your personal goals? What are your financial goals? What are your business goals? You know, what kind of reputation and branding do you want to present to the world with your business? Um, you can go through and see about, um, sorry, like sales, marketing, um, your actual physical location. You know, are you going to have a physical location or are you going to do everything virtually? What about your employees? Um, let me think. Well, while you're thinking, right. while you're thinking of that two employees, I was thinking that I've had, I just wrote down cause I, I want to bring these up when we wrap up, but, uh, have a business plan. You mentioned there are seven parts and you can use a template, uh, tracking everything. I think of software, I think of Excel, I think of a lot of the tools that are available today. Uh, and then you mentioned marketing and I've heard people talk about, businesses, uh, whether they're selling a product or service or whatever it might be, that some people quoted as much as 40 to 50% of your time should be spent on marketing. Because if you have, if you think of the sales funnel concept, if you don't have sales leads going into the top customers, whichever you know, mode you want to talk about, 
you don't have a business. And I'm just thinking back on my life of looking at small businesses. I think of sometimes storefronts, but other types of businesses as well. All this money and effort went into putting together this great product, this great storefront. There's all, but there was no marketing. And six months later, the place is out of business because nobody knew to go there. And so you think, and marketing isn't just advertising, but it's brand management. It's all these different things and customer acquisition and so on. But it's just, it, it's, I'm just amazed how many people miss that piece because without a customer, you don't have a business. And you can be the best at what you do, but if nobody knows about you, how, how are you going to ever make money mm -hmm. doing what you do? You know, so marketing is huge. Exactly. And if you're not the one who's going to be doing the sales, then sorry, you need to find someone who is going to do the sales for you and exactly. marketing and getting your name out there and getting people to know who you are, what you do, what you're all about, you know, so that if they fit, they will reach out and use your services. Well, and you had said earlier that you knew a lot about being the attorney, um, counselor for the companies and they had the businesses, but you did start your own business way back when, when you mentioned your dad inspired you and so forth. And that it happened to be the business of a law practice, but do you recall, that's a long time ago, as you said, but do you recall thinking about what the marketing was there? Because I remember, as I mentioned earlier, my dad was an attorney and he was just shocked. He was still around when advertising started a company. You'd never advertise as an attorney. It was against the, the rules, if you will. But do you remember how you built that practice way back then? Was it just word of mouth or was there anything else that helped build that practice? Well, word of mouth is huge. Referrals mm -hmm. are huge. You should always try to have referral partners. You could always, you should always try to have um, your clients refer their friends and families to you because people like to do business with the ones they know, like, and trust. Mm -hmm. And if someone tells them, oh, I use them and they were a great, you know, they're amazing. I recommend them. You're more likely to fit with them, but that's not enough. You should always have multiple streams of or avenues of marketing, you know, because this is a huge and ever-changing world and your ideal clients might change, like how you reach your ideal clients is going to change as times change. Mm -hmm. And you will have ideal clients that might go to Facebook, others might you know, um, you might be able to reach them through billboards. Others, you might be able to reach through um, other avenues, direct marketing, things of that nature. So you should always think about having multiple avenues and track them to see mm -hmm. which ones are actually working so you don't waste your money. And then as kind of a contrast, Tanya, what about the original law firm and the way you marketed that versus now business and beyond? How does that look different in terms of how you're marketing that? So the marketing avenues are still the same. The marketing message is different mm -hmm. because they're different types of clientele and they're different uh, products, right? So for the legal, it's people and businesses who are having legal issues that we can help them resolve. Right. Um, sorry. And with the business and beyond, I'm really looking for business owners who are small business owners who are stuck, who feel they're overwhelmed, like they're, you know, stuck in their business. The business isn't working for them, who've been in business from two to five years and who just need some support and some help to propel them forward, to reignite their passion to help them build the business that they envisioned, that they wanted to create from the beginning and give them those tools. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, that's good. And so when you said the marketing message is different, what is the marketing message currently as you're putting it together for business and beyond? How would you so, articulate that? The message is you're not alone. You know, I was there. I almost closed down my law firm um, when my dad passed. And instead, I found a way through the help of other people 
you know, to reignite my passion for business and working for myself and helping others and having the luxury of helping them the way I want to. Um, and so other people who might be in that position who are finding that, you know, having your own business is really tough and it's difficult and they are not able to navigate those waters I can help them. I can give them those tools to help them navigate those waters because being good at what you do is not enough. Yeah. You have to be good at the business of business. Right. And I think something too, as you were saying that, I was thinking you have to be good at a lot of things. And as somebody said, and I've listened to many a podcast or listened to many a webinar, whatever it might be, read a book about businesses, and you've got to be the head salesman, the head marketing person, the janitor, the custodian, the bookkeeper, you know, the gardener. I mean, whatever. It's amazing. And I always think maybe that's one of the indicators of people that aren't going to have success is, well, I just want to, uh, I think about the restaurant business. And I've known a number of people have gotten the restaurant business and a year or two later, they're out of business. And to them, it was an ego thing. Why don't you come on down to my place and have a, have a meal, you know, and, and we'll have a chat. Yeah, it's Dave's barbecue place or whatever it might be. And it's just, people don't realize how much work. And I know in, in building my brand, that gratitude guy, I knew it would be a lot of work, but it was even harder than I thought because there's so much, you mentioned at the very top, perseverance. There was so much patience and perseverance that you just have to keep getting off the, you know, off the ground, get back on the horse again, and it can be frustrating. So, well, I'm going to wrap up in a second, and I want to just kind of go over a couple of things, and I have one last question, kind of my favorite question for you, but I wanted to just see if I think back on some of the things you talked about, perseverance, uh, life is tough, which is so very, very true. You're going to fall down and make sure you get up again, and you know, you hear that sometimes similar things from different speakers and different podcast guests or whatever it might be, but you can't hear it too much. I mean, it's just because there's some of them that are just the basic kind of rules, if you want to say in, in many ways. And I also like what you said about a uh, believer in a gratitude practice. If you are grateful, your mood is better. You can over, um, overcome com obstacles, can't even talk more easily. And I think it's so true. And it's, it's kind of like the two people go into a hospital with the same disease and the positive attitude lives and negative attitude dies. I mean, it's, if there wasn't a better example of gratitude there, I don't know what is, but, um, and then I think that talking about other people, you can try to get the gratitude attitude for other people. I think the best way to raise children, in my opinion, and to manage people is to set a great example. And some people don't follow the example though, and it's okay. So, but I really like that. You will fall down, get up again, have a plan, get a goal. And then as far as with the business, uh, have a business plan, use a template, maybe seven parts to that. You mentioned yourself, sales, marketing, physical location, employees, and so forth. Tracking everything is so important. There was a book out called measure what matters. And it's, it's one of the messages was you know, who, I mean, it's like we, why people keep score. I mean, you can't just, you don't just play a game and there's just some random amount of of uh, different plays or something. That's why people keep score of things. And then, of course, the marketing piece too. Uh, and you mentioned the word of mouth and referrals is so important in everything. So, so Tanya, my last question is always the same. And whether it's personal or professional, what is your one thing that you would like to know that you know now you would have liked to know at 18 that would have helped you? Huh. So before I answer that question, I just wanted to... Say, I don't know when failure becomes such a taboo in our lives or mm. falling down and getting up becomes such a taboo because if that were the case and if that were true, nobody would know how to walk. Nobody yeah, would know true. how to talk, you know? So people should not be afraid of failure yeah. because it will only help you become stronger and do things better. Yeah. And what I wish I would have known back then that I know now is how much I love business, mm. the actual business of business. Um, although, you know, I truly believe that things happen for a reason and everything happens in divine timing. So had I not gone through all of the legal work and everything else that I've done, I don't know that my passion for business would have been the same anyways. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think it's just, it's interesting because 
one of the things I quote a lot is Steve Jobs' commencement speech at Stanford in 2005, and he talks about connecting the dots backwards. You can't necessarily connect the dots forward. You have to have the faith that the dots will connect going forward, but you can connect them backwards. And if it hadn't been for the fact that I could go back to going and doing a talk at Linwood, the Linwood Convention Center and running into a young man eight or nine years ago by the name of Michael James, <clears throat> if, I hadn't met, if I hadn't run into him, I wouldn't be talking to you today. I mean, it's just then I could go through all the branches of that tree and all the tributaries, whatever you want to call it. And it's just fascinating. He's right. Jobs is right. When you look back, you can see how all those things connect together. But but then I like your last point that kind of snuck in. I really like about when it's failure becomes such a taboo. And I've said that before, just as you said, we wouldn't even be walking, we'd be talking because, you know, it's it's such a shame and take the walking thing and, and little Johnny, we've all had, you and I have both had children, they take that first step, but they try and they fall down <clears throat> and you encourage them, oh, look, he's so close, she's so close, she took a half a step and she kind of just had to use the couch to, to uh, lean up against. And when they finally do, but what do we do? Otherwise, we say, well, how dumb are you can't even walk? What's wrong? And it's like, wow, you're right. None of us would be walking if we didn't have parents that encourage us to keep trying and get your balance and eventually, you know, be able to walk upright or whatever. So such a good point. Such a good point. So, well, thank you so much for being a guest. Let me um, wrap up with a couple of things for the podcast. As I mentioned earlier, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. And as I mentioned earlier, earlier please give me a five-star rating and uh, uh, like what, if you like what you hear, I do appreciate that. Uh, and I, knew, I know that people are struggling. Tanya talked a little bit about um, some of the things that were going on as she hasn't struggled, but going through and finding out the different paths and so forth. I do have my gratitude coaching program, which will give you a coach that fully believes in you and can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind could conceive. The support you receive is unmatched in getting you to believe in you and make changes that you've been wanting and needing to make. Whether it's your finances, your relationships, your career, or your life's journey that you want to change, and this is a good program for you. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance, and a very high level of accountability, along with an attitude of gratitude all combined to ensure your personal success. My four-month proprietary gratitude coaching program is priced at $4,500. And from a podcast listeners, you get an extra month for free. Just let me know that you heard about it on the podcast. And you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com. You can see in the background also That Gratitude Guy as well as thatgratitudeguypodcast.com and email David at That Gratitude. And then one uh, gratitude guy. And then one last thing for those that like to get the Monday morning minute. You can go to your text and text in the number 22828. That's five digits, digits 22828. And in the message box, type in gratitude guy, and it'll give you a link to sign up and you'll get my 60 second Monday morning minute every single week. And that is it for this week. I, again, appreciate you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much. I am David George Brooks, that gratitude guy. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.